Hello everyone and welcome to God Talks. Tonight we have an amazing uh, speaker, presenter, preacher, activist. I don't actually know if there's a good, <laughs> a good piece of terminology to describe the Reverend Dr. Prophetess Naomi Washington Lee Park. Um, I met Naomi a few years ago when she was still working for the National LGBT Task Force. And she brought faith leaders from varying traditions, ecumenical and interfaith together to talk about how we actually might be responding to the Black Lives Matter movement. And so we took that at that time before even many of the things we're experiencing now. And she was so prophetic even in bringing, bringing that group together. And now I think she's still using that same energy and life in her work in the city of Philadelphia. So without further ado, I'm going to bring on my sister, my friend, uh, who I look up to because of just the bad work she is doing to help change this world. Help me welcome Reverend Naomi Leapart. Hello, <laughs> sister. How are you? Hey, my friend. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for being here tonight on God Talks. People are waiting and ready to hear uh, some of the things that you have to say. And I want to hear definitely more about the work you're doing in the city of Philadelphia. And of course, there's going to be a question about that. But I'm going to jump right in um, to our time tonight. And the first question is for your new crew in Philly, <laughs> the folks that you're working with, your new colleagues in the mayor's office, how would they describe the Reverend Naomi Washington Lee Park. What are some things they would say about you? You know, it's so interesting you asked this question because I posted, there's a meme going around, um, what do you think I'm good at, is the question. And you post it and you invite people to answer. So I posted that yesterday or the day before. And so I guess I'm gonna just say what people said. Um, I think people would say that I am always seeking to try to get at the hardest truth. Um, and that I am always interested in depth more than breadth. That um, that I am a daydreamer and easily distracted. Um, that I am a, am a workaholic. Um, that I am adventurous and spontaneous. Uh, to the point, I mean, Family members have called me a daredevil. Um, hmm. I think I am. I've learned how to be bossy in a diplomatic way. Come on now, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> the bossy um, diplomat, I like that. Yeah. Um. And that's connected to my type A control freak uh, personality. Um, so that's good. You you giving me a lot. Even before we get into the other question, <laughs> now I want, of course, you to to ask some of that. So, talk to me. Where does a daredevil who is often pushing boundaries? Where do you find your inspiration? for such a time like this? Like, I, I, I want to contextualize it in the world in which we're living. Where are you finding your inspiration right now? Mm. I would say first that inspiration is critical to my uh, generative, creative process. And sometimes that's a liability. But so we can talk about that later if you want. That I, if I'm not inspired, I have a hard time producing. Um, I am inspired by cartoons, 
And one day, a couple of weeks ago, I just watched SpongeBob for three hours. Okay. You have to unpack that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love science fiction. I love cartoons. I love graphic novels. Partly because they push me out of the world we're in and into other worlds. So it's a form of escapism for me, but it's also inspiration that gets me some material to use to try to construct what we want for this world to be. So that inspires me. Um, I have recently become a plant mom. Hmm. So I didn't realize you could order plants on the internet. So I I bought a plant maybe two, two and a half months ago. And it came and I was all excited. I have no green thumbs at all. But I thought maybe if I could take care of this plant. Again, it's a distraction from all the things I feel like I can't control in the world. Um, I can create the conditions for this plant to grow. And so now I'm up to five plants. Is it five? Yeah. And I was saying to someone, I feel gentler and more patient when I'm taking care of them. And I'm obsessive about when should I water, how much, is the sunlight right? I'm just paying better attention. And that inspires me. So if so, let's extrapolate that to our day-to-day and the realities of black and brown bodies. And I would imagine as a black woman in America, you were already paying attention. And I might extrapolate that being a plant mom has now made you pay even a greater degree of attention. What are you seeing in our world right now? I mean, if you were to be the proof text for what's happening in this moment, what what is some language, Naomi, that you would put to the current situation we're in in this country? Um, I see an over-reliance on force and domination. I mean, first of all, I would say, I don't think we should rely on domination. We are, as a nation, over-reliant on domination as a solution for all of the things that plague our society. I can just make you do it. I can compel you whether it's by threatening your economic well-being or threatening you with hell, fire, and brimstone, or threatening you with the power to end your life. I can just compel you to get into lockstep, to conform. And I would use that kind of metaphor to describe what's going on related to the police state, the carceral state, but just in general. Um, our society's guiding principle is um, if you can't beat them, beat them again. You know, if you can't beat them, kill them. Um, so that's what I would say. I also see um, it's almost like for black women in particular, it's at rock bottom, perhaps. And I see us doing some extraordinary creative work. Um, everybody from all of the black women who are running for office and winning 
all of the black women who are saying yes to the call to ministry and whatever religious tradition, um, all of the black women who are producing artistically. And so it's just this weird, you know, we are in danger. And so it's almost like this abundance of creative output and brilliant um, strategic leadership. Um, so I'm seeing what happens when you literally push people's backs to the wall. We respond with, with excellence. And on the one hand, that is amazing to see. On the other hand, that scares me. Tell me, tell me what scares you about it. It's almost like I'm scared that we won't know what it feels like to live and create when we're not under duress, when we're not facing imminent danger. Like, can we just ever exhale? Can we ever live outside of the bounds of trauma? Is this all a trauma response? Do we know another kind of life? Uh, that's scary to me. And in the middle of kind of what many are describing as a racial pandemic, which, uh, you know, I've been struggling with for some people, they just became aware of this in the past month. <laughs> it's like, whoa, you know, and I think for, if you're embodied in this this flesh, in a black and a brown body, this, is, this has been life. And you are kind of holding now that it's becoming so apparent to other people. In the middle of all of that, you have worked for the National LGBT Task Force. Now you're working for the city of Philadelphia. A very blunt question, Naomi, how are you maintaining your own sanity? And no, I'm not asking about self-care stuff. I'm talking about how as a sister in this world who is critically engaged in this work on a daily basis, how are you f maintaining sanity in the midst of that? Uh, the short answer is I don't do a good job. Um, because I think that so much of my own the barometer of Naomi is wrapped up in the barometer of Naomi's folk. And so it's been, it's been hard. I am trying to let myself be taught a new way of being. You know, the people I'm in closest intimate relationships with can have the skills that I don't have. And so I'm learning from them, you know, close the laptop at five, six o'clock. Um, go to bed. Go to bed. Um, say no. Um, these are all new lessons for me. Um, I'm also finding my own way to well-being by... So much of my, what makes me swirl has to do with my, the shames that I carry. Um, shame about decisions I've made over my life or shame about, you know, why can't I just get myself together? I mean, this, this person is talking to me in my head. And so... It's about discharging the shame. Um, so that's, 
that's therapy, but that's also finding what my wife likes to call confessional partners who can hear me confess my shame and then hold me accountable to not letting those control and determine me. Um, but I don't do a good job. I tend to go and go and go and then absolutely crash. Uh, and it's at the point where sometimes I don't even feel it coming. I see the wall getting closer and closer. And so it's something I'm, I probably am going to be working on the rest of my life. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of us walking right alongside you and <laughs> trying and trying to work uh, work through that and work on that. Um, I, I want to talk more about the shame narrative because I think there's some power in that, and I want to interweave in it this narrative of that REV in front of your name. So the first question is: Is there any is any of that shame? rooted and grounded in the historicity of your faith journey. And just separately from that, I'd love for us to hear the journey to REV <laughs> mm. and the complexity of your identities. Uh, a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that absolutely, I first learned to be ashamed in church. Um, you know, at the same time as I heard over and over again, we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, we sang it, we said it, they preached it. But yeah, I I learned that my deepest desires were shameful. And I don't just mean carnal, fleshly desires. I mean, my ambition was shameful. Um, I learned that intimacy was shameful. I mean, I, I grew up in a church context where I found people who loved me with their lives. And that childhood church was the site of my deepest trauma. Um, I was victimized by a pastor who took advantage of me and sexually abused me. And so I learned then that desire, that intimacy, that love was grounded in, shrouded in secrecy. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and it was so, it was such a perversion of, I had someone to tell me that these things about me, that my brain or my creativity or my were objects of of his desire of his the the abuse of his power was connected to who I am and so it takes years to if ever uh to unlearn the, the those connections that you draw as a kid um so I would say, yeah, yeah. That, that that religious upbringing was it was what taught me what shame is. Um, my journey to ordained ministry. I mean, I was a church girl. Spent every day in church. My whole social life was church. I learned how to speak in front of people. I learned how to sing in front of people. I learned how to be in a group. I learned how to travel well. I, learned, I mean, all of these things I cherish uh, within the context of being a good church girl. 
And when I got grown, I said, I'm going to try not going to church. So I, I moved to 700 miles away from home, went to college, and said, I ain't going. I think I've had enough church. I got it. I don't have to go. Um, but guilt, shame brought me back. You know, I was like, man, if they knew I didn't go to church, somebody's going to come get me. <laughs> but if I'm really honest, too, there was a little bit of my own desire to continue to develop spiritually. So I went to church because I felt compelled, but also because I wanted to be there. Um, and it never dawned on me that I was being beckoned to religious life in a vocational way. My nickname in college was Reverend. Come on now. You know, that still was not to me an indication that perhaps I should look deeper. Um, it took a full 10 years after leaving home. And several more bizarre, knock me upside my head experiences where people just presumed I was a minister. For me to say, maybe this is what drove me. Maybe I can be the minister that I needed. I needed somebody to see that Naomi despite the fact that Naomi could string a sentence together and was getting all A's and was in 10 different extracurriculars and was on the path to being, you know, special, was utterly traumatized. And utterly ashamed that I had all of these words and I had all of this, you know, she's so wise for her age and she's so, she's, she's been here before, but I couldn't tell anybody what the pastor was doing to me. Like I didn't, I didn't have the words and I felt like that was my fault. I internalized that. So I was like, well, maybe I can be a minister who sees something and says something. Um, mixed within there is what's going on inside of me related to sexual orientation. So when you have your wiring, your love map contorted, you don't know if you can trust what's going on inside you. You don't know what is a manifestation of trauma and what is, you know, coming to yourself. And so I was just all over the place in terms of intimate relationships. And what felt most comfortable, Darrell, I ain't told nobody this. I mean, I ain't said this publicly. I just want you to know. <laughs> hey, God talks makes it come out of you, so we're ready. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, what felt most comfortable was what was shrouded in mystery and secrecy. What was the 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 same conditions that were set within the context of this abusive childhood abuse, right? That that doesn't make for sustained, long-term, loving, holy coupling. Um, so while I was in seminary, um, I needed to also have the conversion 
to, you know, loving in the light uh, and not in the shadows. I needed to come to myself. Um, and I'm grateful that the circumstances were stitched together such that seminary was a time where I could be attuned to God's call to be the minister that I needed to see and experience as a kid. And I could answer God's call to love in the light and to just to stop blaming myself for what happened to me. Um, so that's the journey to REV. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you for your vulnerability. And uh, I think um, someone just sort of chatted in there to say that they know that your testimony is setting someone free, mm -hmm. um, Senator Pat Spearman. And I, I think, so I want to, I, I want to, take what she said to offer the the question to you or an invitation then what would you say to someone who's watching this who the church is not a safe space because of the leader and their leader isn't doing what you said which was i need to walk in the light and i actually want to be a, a minister who doesn't mimic the same kind of abuse but they're sitting in that abuse right now and they might be having the same tape that Naomi had then, which was, oh, well, yeah. you know, who am I going to, you know, can you just offer a, maybe a word of affirmation or just something into the atmosphere for that person who's seeing and listening to you right now, but yet saying, I don't know if I have the courage to be as strong and dope as she has been in this. I, I just don't know if I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say what might have been helpful for you to hear. Yeah. You don't have to take what you can get. You don't have to for fear of missing out. Right? That's my big thing, FOMO, right? You don't have to stay. It, I know it feels like this is this is as good as it gets. I mean, you know, I got I got a role with because there are there are life giving, salvific things also here, right? There are the people who I know embrace me and would take care of me. Um, I love um, feeling like I can, you know, I know this, this is familiar to me. But you don't, I just want you to know, because I needed to know, that melancholy is not your lot. That joy unspeakable, as the book says, is yours. And I want you to know that nothing that is happening to you determines you. Nothing that's happening to you is your fault. Um, and that the journey to be free from shame is not without terrifying doubt. Um, and 
that mixed in there will be finally rest from the exhaustion of being ashamed, the exhaustion of contorting oneself. That's exhausting. And so what's available is rest from that. If you are willing to take a step, whatever that step is, based on your timeline, based on your pacing, that rest is available. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I think that I just want to name and I, I'm going to say a blessing for you later, but I want to just say right now, there's so much a part of your testimony that I think is, I think it's hard to talk about how to be healed if you haven't gone through the storm in mm. and of itself. Mm. And, and what you, in the words that you're saying, it's obvious that you've gone through it and not that you're even proclaiming that it's all healed, but I think it's helpful to be the truth teller to say, I'm on a healing journey and here's some of the steps. I love that. Take a step. Um, I think the church has also given us lies about, well, we're all done. You know, the, 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 you start the testimony and you end it with, and it's all great. <laughs> I think the power in your story is saying it's a journey and I'm actually still on it. And the invitation yeah, yeah. is to come alongside the journey. You don't have to have it all fixed, but can you be in the journey? So yeah. that's yeah. really powerful. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about, um, Naomi, with everything that you've been through with, I mean, you have like eight books, sister, just want you to know like, everything you <laughs> say, I hope you go back and watch this. Cause there's, there's about eight books in there. Um, but I want to, I want to tap a little bit deeper into based on everything that you've been through, the role you currently have now, what the anointing God has placed on your life. What is Naomi's passion right now? Mm. I'm really, I'm learning. I'm going to, I'm going to take these headphones off. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah. Okay. 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 Can, okay, you, hear can me? you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, but okay, I can't hear you. So wait a minute. Let me see. <laughs> um, You're good and clear. So I want my mic to be. Okay. 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 So as Naomi's doing that, one of the um, if you are watching this and you get a chance to interact with Naomi, go to her Facebook page, <laughs> go to YouTube and just listen to some of her sermons. I mean, power. Now your head might hurt afterward because the sister's going to drop so much knowledge that you'll have to go back in the back. <laughs> but it is like if you want a black womanist theologian who is doing the work and I mean, who pre will preach you silly then you need to listen to just some of her thoughts. Uh, Naomi, can you hear me now? Potentially. Okay, I don't hear that either. Um, so as she's doing that, that, that's just one component of who she is. Another amazing opportunity that I had was to do a workshop with her um, at a gathering that the National LGBT Task Force was coordinating where Naomi actually taught us how to use different things to problematize and complicate worship. And for those of you who are often struggling with, well, how do I, you know, what can I do in, in terms of worship? Or maybe I don't have the right words or what have you. Um, she taught us how to think about the bulletin, to think about your call to worship, to think about your benediction. Um, all of the ways in which uh, the worship service invites you to challenge the status quo, uh, that you can be able to do that in worship. What about now?
Okay, okay testing. testing. I can hear you. Can you hear me? You can hear me. I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll let you. Um, 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 I think I think we'll. Testing. testing. I can hear you. Oh, well, praise the Lord. Oh, uh, but I hear the echo again. <laughs> no, but we. I think you're fine. I don't hear it as much, so I think you might be okay. I was just, anyway, okay. celebrating okay. your accolades and telling people how amazing you are and the other ways that people should <laughs> connect with you. Um, but I was asking you, what's Good. your passion right now? What's the thing that's driving and kind of, and I mean, you know, because we could talk about the work, but really, I mean, in you as a, as a creative being, what's, where are you finding your passion right now? Hmm. I love um, I'm trying to think of how to say. I find myself um, deeply passionate about I don't about helping people or it, it comes from my own desire to do this. Like what if we could go back and be kids again like what if we could we could remember i remember writing a short story when i was in middle school i wrote it on whatever paper was available to me and so eventually i had pages and pages and pages of a short story and i remember the day that i let somebody else read it because it was that was a big deal and that person was like, we should show everybody else in class. And I went to a small kind of private school, 15 folk in a class. And it went around the class. And people were like, okay, so when's the next chapter? Like what's happening next with these characters? And I just remember thinking, so that's a thing I could just, tell these tell stories the story that came out of my, out of my head, head and you, and you find, find joy, joy in reading these reading stories? stories? And then, and then life got life much got more, complicated. more complicated. Like I had, to, I had to, you know, go to school and go to work so that I could so be a productive be citizen, citizen and, and, and obligations, obligations and responsibilities. And responsibilities. And I haven't gotten back to writing stories. And so what I'm trying to do is like write the first line of a story every day. Like I haven't even shared that with anybody, but like I have these scraps of paper where I'm like writing the first line of a story. Because I don't want to be reduced to a robot. Um, so I'm trying to create that for myself. And anytime I can contribute to, to making a space where that's possible for other people, I want to do that. Um, what was the thing that got you really excited before you decided that that was impractical, irresponsible. So I'm passionate about that. Um, I've been trying to collect vinyl records. Uh, my wife bought me a turntable and I've been like trying to get every 
piece of music I can think of on vinyl. So I can, the sound is different. And so I can just lose myself in the sound of Aretha or Stevie Wonder or Anita Baker. These are some of the folks I have on vinyl. Um, I'm also recently into collecting black art. Um, you know, I'm not an art collector by any stretch, but I'm learning how to like, okay, what does it mean to collect art? So I'm surrounding myself with art that black people made. Um, and that has meant something to me. So I'll be honest and say, it's really hard for me to talk about passions without talking about work. <laughs> and that's, that's part of my you issue. Can, you can go to work, but I wanted to get, I wanted to get. Thank you. Other no, I need to be pushed in that way. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, but I, I mean, I, that's a good entry into that. I mean, tell us a little bit about this, this call you have in Philadelphia, but, but I also want to sort of ask you for a challenge because there are some preachers watching this there are some faithful members of churches who are also asking how they should be quote showing up in the world so i would love to hear more about what you're doing in the city of philadelphia but then also some push for the church folk yeah yeah <laughs> so, so my role, my role within, the within the context of city government, government is uh, as, director uh, as director for faith-based faith and interfaith affairs. affairs. Located okay, in the mayor's, the office, mayor's office, the role, the role was, designed was designed to facilitate, to facilitate good relationships, relationships between, between city government, city government specifically the mayoral, the mayoral administration, administration and, faith, and communities. faith communities. It's also designed so to designed help to, to help translate, to translate what goes on in city hall. In city hall for faith communities, to contextualize it for them. Um, I think it was also designed to set tables that faith leaders could join to have influence over the goings on at City Hall, uh, to get feedback, to help with engagement and outreach so that we could so that get, we get the, the real stories from, stories from, from residents, residents that then that would then impact, impact policymaking. policymaking. Yes. Um, um, more, recently, more recently since the pandemic, the pandemic there, is there is room, room in the role, in the role for being for a pastoral being a presence, presence in City Hall, in City Hall. Which, is which is the part that I didn't that anticipate, anticipate really. really. Uh, uh, I thought this was like the furthest thing from pastoral ministry. It's more like coordination, you know, with the clergy and with people of faith. But I got the job in October and then January, February, we're talking about the coronavirus. And then March, that's it. And so much of my job has really been um, um shaped, shaped by, the by the pandemic and the fact and that the people fact that needed people somebody, somebody to say, say you don't have to pretend like everything, like everything is fine, is fine. Right. Um, um and to, and to s with the convergence, with the convergence of, of you know you yet know, another yet uprising, another uprising. Um, um to, to also offer a prophetic word within the context of City Hall to say, people put you here so that you can do right by them. So I'm not going to pray peace, peace when there is no peace. You asked me to come to do the opening prayer. I'm going to honor that invitation. But I might not pray the thing that you think I will pray. Um, so that's so felt that's really felt good, really to, be good to be able to retain, retain 
um, my desire anyway, to offer a prophetic word, to hold folks accountable to the moral ideals that they proclaim. So, so that's the role. Um, I think that I have been able to gently, yet unapologetically, invite faith leaders to see that I am not the gatekeeper to your proximity and influence and status because you know the mayor. Like I'm not, you're getting close to me, may not yield the status points that you think it will. Um, that I'm not here to provide that kind of access. I'm here to um, make the way smooth for people, everyday Philadelphians, to talk to those who represent them and work for them. And I'm here to, lately, um, we just had a conversation today about how we also interrogate the way that our society is imploding in large part due to religious understanding. Religious understanding about power, about the law and order, about saints and sinners, right? That faith communities are not off the hook when we say something like abolish the carceral state. Um, that in some ways, these ideas that have been hurting and killing our folk were designed by people of faith. Wow. Yes. And so, you know, I was thinking, well, how can I weigh in in this citywide, certainly, but also national conversation about public safety? I understand that I represent this administration. And so, how can I draw? the connections, how can I wade into this conversation? And I'm like, if you see God as a law enforcer, it's real clear to me why then we worship police. Real clear. There was a napkin, I need to throw it across. And so, how can How I can help I people, help people by, by creating a space, space where they can name, name. yeah, I guess I, I, guess I, did, I did learn, learn in, my in my faith community, community what, I what I should think about, think about the, police, the police or what I should, think, I should about think about criminality. criminality. And, therefore, and therefore, faith communities, faith communities must be must at the conversation, the conversation to, to determine what role will we play in ensuring communal safety? Since we have played a role in determining the current state of affairs. So we have an obligation to imagine our own role in undoing what plagues us. So, that's that's been what I've been trying to do in my role. What's the push that you have for faithful leaders? I mean, in some ways, well, city of Philadelphia has a role that the city of Omaha does not have, the city of Cleveland, you know, like all across this country, where we won't have a, a Reverend Naomi Washington Lee Park. <laughs> What's our push? What's the call to faith communities? 
Because, you know, we caught up in whether or not we can go back inside of a building. Yes. 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 What what push might you have for the faithful watching tonight? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I would say is, is, like our ancestors ancestors said, get your house house in order. You know, know, religious institutions institutions are often often microcosms microcosms of social institutions institutions broadly. broadly. So if you got folk folk brutalizing, brutalizing, you know, you may not have have military military weapons, weapons, but folk get brutalized brutalized in religious communities. communities. Folk Folk get get sentenced sentenced to to permanent alienation. alienation. In religious, in religious community, community. Um, um, folk, folk preach one thing and practice, practice another, another in religious in community. community. So we have, we to, have to have some integrity. Have some so I would say, I would say do, an, do audit an audit of your own, own congregation. congregation. We're asking asking our municipalities and our governments, governments, as we should, should, to look at the budget. budget, Your budget will tell me me where your heart is, is. where your treasure treasure is, is, there's your heart. heart. Same is true true. in religious religious institutions. institutions. And so so we can't ask. ask. Well, Well, we can. I mean, I I think we've been been asking. asking. We we should not preach what we what we won't practice. So it's an internal, inward look. Then I think we have to we have to dispose of the notion that we exist to be power brokers. And that's hard because, I mean, in my role, people are like, well, who are the influential faith leaders? And I'm like, by what metric? Like, what do you mean? Um, but I think that we, the religious community, has bought into the notion that we exist, that, that like the power of God should give us should give us popular status within a within a a city, a city. Yeah. that, that um, um, the more numbers I have, the more wise I am. It's like, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Where? That ain't true. That ain't true. So, so, um, so we, we have, have to first, first break away, away from, from the notion, the notion that, that we are somehow in the center and not as in the Christian context as Jesus was standing on the outside of power, urging power to do right by the least of these. That is our role. So clamoring for position at the center is not, is not the role. The role. Um, um, we we need, need access, access to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh in order to order tell, tell Pharaoh, Pharaoh that, my that my people go. Come on. <laughs> That's, That's not to sit at Pharaoh's table, table and try to see Pharaoh's side. side. No, no it's, it's not. not. So, so um, I, think I think the challenge, challenge is, is be politically engaged, but don't be don't fooled. Be fooled. The, you are not, um, you're not there to make friends. I mean, metaphorically speaking, you're not there to ingratiate yourself to empire. empire. I hear a lot of people say, well, don't you have to, don't you have to do that in order to then 
flip the script and tell people off. No, that's not how this works. You can't ingratiate yourself and then, you know, pull the knife out your back pocket. Oh, that's so violent. I shouldn't say that. Um, I just think so many of us have been convinced that we can we can survive in empire settings because we have Jesus. And it's like, you too can be hoodwinked. You too can be used. You too can be seduced by the aroma of power. And if we're not vigilant, we will accept much less than we actually deserve and demand as people. Um, I, I just want us to be mindful of that. That's really powerful. I think, thank you. I think that's a powerful push and a powerful invitation. Uh, I, I mean, I love that you, you may be, in, you, you're invited before Pharaoh to tell Pharaoh, let my people go, not to <laughs> sit and enjoy and be like, Pharaoh, give me some more of that. I, <laughs> um, I love that. I'm, our, our, I feel like our time is running away so quickly, but so I'm gonna, I, I'm torn between a harder question and a lighter question, but in my world, you know, they probably are both hard and invasive and all that. So. <laughs> I, I think you can handle this one. This will, and this will kind of be our final question, unfortunately. Um, I want to know, where was the God for Naomi in that church? With that pastor. And then I want to know, where is the God of the Naomi who has a national platform and preaches and teaches and, you know, is, I would say, is a modern day theologian in your own right in the work that you're called to do. I want to hear about the presence of God in those mm -hmm. two periods of your mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time with the first part of the question because one of my maybe bones to pick with God is that I felt so deserted. Um, I think that perhaps, you know, I don't believe in a God who is, you know, pulling the kind of a puppet master God. But the fact that I was able to um, be accepted to college, a college that was so far, so far away. And the and fact, fact that, that my senior, my senior year, in year in high school, when I was when making, I was a, making decision a decision about college, about college there was a there spring was a revival, revival at this very, this church. very church. And the revivalist, the revivalist is, a is a pastor in West in Philadelphia. West now, I had never been to Philly. I didn't know nothing about Philly. I didn't know that the university that I had applied and got accepted to was nine blocks from this church. So I go up to the pastor at this revival and I just say, I got accepted to the school. Do you know, it was so silly now looking back, I'm like, do you do you know that school? <laughs> you know, I'm like, are you familiar? 
And the pastor said to me, when you get there, so his presumption was, you're going to make the decision to come to the school. Here's the number to my office. We will send a van to come pick you up and bring you to church. Part of why I couldn't, I couldn't imagine getting out of this abusive situation was because I was like, but where will I go to church? I mean, church is important to me. Church is where my friends are. Church is where I experienced the transcendent nature of Black religiosity, right? The sounds and the movements and the fire and energy. Where will I go to church? Who will be my pastor? And so he just pushes this card in my hand. And that, in retrospect, may have been God saying, I got you. You can leave. This is the way out of no way. That's like the one glimpse because I really just felt like nobody protected me. You know, not even like the people in my house, nobody protected me. And um, so then it's, that's hard. But this, this encounter that happened to happen Right when I was discerning, that gave me permission to leave. I think now, I mean, I feel like I experienced God in every, everywhere, like in the lines of poetry I read um, or in the plants that change every day. Something new I can see. Oh, there's something new there. Um, I see God in my friendships with people who hang out with me even when they know me. <laughs> you know, I think it's the scariest thing to be known. And there are folks who know me and still love me. And I just think that's a miracle of God. Um, I definitely see God in the construct of my blackity black queer family. You know, that we are the embodiment of God. We persist when the forces of evil would desire us to be to go away, that we figure out a way to love each other when for so many people, there's still no, there's no framework for that. And people are like, so y'all are married to each other? Mm. <laughs> you know, um, I see God when my wife is like, gently, she knows how to um, to get me to care for my own self as much as I care about the state of the world. Um, that's, 
I experience the love of God and the love of others. Um, it's not the the God who the God of grand gestures. It's it's the God of the daily mercies. Um, so. In some ways, I've shifted my expectation of God. Maybe I don't see God as protector anymore. Can I even admit that, right? Maybe I don't see that anymore. Because there was such deep disappointment then that I have a hard time coming back around to God as protect me from all hurt, harm, and danger. But I do see a God in the daily glimpses of grace, grace and, of joy, and of joy, of my wife is upstairs wife cooking is something. something. Let me tell Let me you, tell you. <laughs> that's God. <laughs> you know, cause I've had a long day and she knows I'm hungry, right? That's God. That's God. Mm. You know? And so and my so prayer is that everybody would experience, experience God in God the daily glimpses you know, I've stopped looking for the grand gestures. I mean, like they come, I'm like, whoa. But those small mercies, the diet of small graces, that's what keeps me going. Pastor, thank you so much again for everything tonight, for pouring out to all of us. Um, and thank you for letting us go a little bit over because I, I felt like we got, we were about to get robbed because of some headphones, but you came back. <laughs> um, and and um, let me offer a blessing of some words I heard when you were sharing tonight. I feel like embodied in this moment as a cisgendered black male pastor, I want to apologize to you for a cisgendered pastor who is intimidated because of the power and anointing in you and therefore were inappropriately used that power to try to steal your joy and your anointing because your very presence overshadowed who they were. So I acknowledge in that moment to little Naomi and to now that you are more than enough, that you were created fully whole and that everything you bring into this world, the world desperately needs and needed and is receiving. And as your brother, I, I wanna name that. And I know somebody apologizing this moment doesn't take it away, but I think it's about our acknowledging the wrongs, naming them for what they were, the inappropriate nature, the cruelty of it, and the sin, the sin of trying to steal and snatch somebody's anointing. The second thing I want to name for you is that you have an anointing, <laughs> an anointing so strong that it is embodied in the scripture that many are called, but few are chosen. So I name and reaffirm for you that Naomi, you have been chosen. You have been chosen for the walk and the journey that you're on. It's not by accident. It's not you stumbled upon it, but literally, the Holy Spirit has chosen you to do the journey that you're on. What that will mean, my sister, is that you will write the text. You will write the journey. You will write and author the manuscript. And blessed are those who come after you because they won't have to write the manuscript. They won't have to order the journey. And maybe because they're called and you were chosen. But in this moment, I want to affirm and thank God for your willingness in the midst of struggle, sister, to write that manuscript in the middle of some storm and rain to command that the storm will not rage. In the middle of your own hurts and struggles and the things that you're walking through, you have yet found in the depth of you a yes. And it is not just a yes of the next thing. It's a yes of liberation. And so may people who will read that manuscript, may people who will read the manual, may people who will read just your testimony be affirmed and blessed 
as deeply and richly and more so than even we've been in this little chunk of an hour, which is just the taste <laughs> of being able to be with you. You are seen, you are known, and the anointing on your life is felt. Thank you for how many times you told Pharaoh, let my people go, not just in your words, but in your very life. So I adore you, you know that. <laughs> I will get some catfish and chicken with you any night. Now, everybody yeah. doesn't know about that, but you will yeah. know what that's about. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Naomi. I'm going to take you out for one second, and then I'll be back to grab you. Um, everyone, just if you missed any part of tonight, go back and watch again and just be blessed um, by Ray, Reverend Naomi Washington Lee Part. Um, tomorrow, I'll post the YouTube version um, of this conversation, and I'll also post a link to where what charity that you can donate um, with along with Reverend Naomi and uh, maybe even in her honor if you feel so led. Next week we're going to be talking with a friend of mine, uh, the Reverend Emily Linderman. Emily was supposed to be on God Talks earlier in this month um, and then we had to reschedule because I was at an uprising and my sister called and said you might not be available tonight because she knew but next week we will be with her so come back next week and hear about Emily's story and chaplaincy um, and God talk same time same place God bless you